Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Thanks for listening. Happy New Year if you're listening to this before New Year's Eve. Hope you have a safe and happy New Year. If you're listening to this in 2023, well, welcome to 2023. We are going to end 2022, though, with a mailbag edition of the podcast. But first, before we get into those questions, we've got a couple things to talk about. Never a dull moment around SMU, it seems like these days. Uh, We've got two new transfer offers to break down, as well as the news that SMU quarterback Tanner Mordecai entered the transfer portal. So I'm going to kind of lead off uh, with some of my thoughts on that, what it means, why it happened. Um, And he's expected, and if not already, has gone public with his commitment uh, to Wisconsin. He's going to head up to play in the Big Ten for his final season of college eligibility. And so, look, a lot of people have asked me or asked me before the season, you know, what happens after next season at the quarterback position? And the expectation was always that this was going to be Tanner Mordecai's last year at SMU, whether he uh, went to the NFL or somehow if it didn't work out and Preston Stone balled out, took his job, he was going to go somewhere else and play another year. And so Tanner, and you you guys will recall, it was kind of an interesting announcement that he was turning pro. Um, he just kind of told us, yeah, I'm walking at senior day and I'm turning pro. And I think the door was kind of pushed open for him to return to college. I think he didn't probably get the feedback he wanted, um, which, I mean, understandable. But at the same token, I, I do feel like Tanner can go into the NFL, probably be a practice squad guy. Um, he's just been too productive over the last two seasons to not. Now he's going to go back to the Power Five ranks and play quarterback for Luke Fickle, who really came away impressed with Tanner Mordecai the last two years going against him. So think about that um, and kind of how you view his time at SMU. Um, he's somebody that was highly productive, has the respect of Luke Fickle, um, and now he's bringing him in to help solidify things at Wisconsin. So, um, you know, Best of luck to Tanner. I think, though, this was always going to be his last year. And I think when they evaluated what was next for him, I I feel like the draft and or the portal was the most likely route for him um, coming off of this season. So uh, I don't think it's anything more than that. Um, And and now he'll head off to college. He's not going to TCU. He's not going to Baylor, both schools that would have liked to have added him. Uh, Instead, he's going up to Wisconsin. He's probably going to make a nice NIL uh, payday from it. So that was kind of the news that broke Thursday night. Um, if you're listening to this and uh, we, we talked a lot about about on the board afterwards, but he's headed up to Wisconsin now. And then two new transfer offers in the last 24 hours that went out, uh, both at positions of need uh, at tight end SMU offered Notre Dame transfer Kane Baring. Uh, I'm probably butchering that a little, little bit or wrong. Uh, but look, former four-star prospect, He played in a few games as a true freshman in 2021 and then suffered a torn ACL that took all of a year for him to recover. Obviously, Notre Dame has a terrific tight end room and and pedigree in that respect. Um, And he played in one game uh, this past season, kind of late in the season, um, played in a game. So he's now looking for a new home. Um, Somebody that uh, in talking with our colleague and former colleague uh, on the SMU side of things, Patrick Angle, who now covers Notre Dame for on three. He said he's a really, really skilled receiver. Um, He'd bring that in in droves uh, to SMU's offense if he's healthy. Uh, He's about 6'4", 245 pounds, so he's got some size to him. He's got multiple years left. Let me be clear. North Texas tight end Jake Roberts, though, is still very much in play, very much in the portal, uh, and a target that SMU would love to land um, but now they had to jump in uh, for Kane. He's picked up a few offers. He's got some upside, and we'll see if SMU um, can get in on him. The, the staff did recruit him when they were at Miami. So um, Kane Barong uh, is the uh, or Baring is the uh, latest tight end offer for SMU. And then we wake up to news on Friday that SMU offered Utah State transfer defensive end Daniel Gr- uh, Grijak, um, which is a great defensive end name. Uh, Grizak. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, way I'm pronouncing it for now. Uh, but added eight and a half sacks in 2022 for Utah State. Funny enough, I was just texting with them before 
we got on this podcast and he reminded me that uh, he just played at SMU in his bowl game. So he's very familiar with the campus and what it looks like around the hilltop. So um, he's still working things out. We'll have more notes on him for our subscribers at OnThePonyExpress.com. Check that out. $10 gets you access all the way until football season. So this whole run of spring practices, basketball season, recruiting over the summer. Um, and remember, the pretty much 99 or 95% of SMU's recruiting class was done over the summer. So don't miss out on that. $10 until uh, August 31st. Uh, that's the deal we have going right now. For you guys, uh, it is going to end soon, so jump on board. Uh, so we'll have more notes on Daniel soon. 6'1", uh, I believe 245 pounds, so kind of a sawed-off defensive end, but highly productive, played four seasons at Nevada, um, has 16 career sacks, uh, dropped down to Utah State, and, and then turned it around and really had a terrific 2022 season. So he's already added some serious offers from Cincinnati, Indiana, Missouri, um, were among those that I saw. Uh, he had tweeted out already, and he said all are in contact. So it's going to be an interesting race. He needs to set visits here soon and get that going. But um, those are the two latest transfer offers. So with that, let's go ahead and start this mailbag podcast off. Um, we're going to start uh, with some recruiting questions uh, on the 2024 class and jump in on that and then move into the team. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, expectations for 2023, and then also um, wrap up with kind of how I view the de December calendar and kind of what's next uh, and, and how maybe the NCAA fixes it. We've got a fun question for the end. I will say this, we're not going to talk about notable transfers to and from our AAC peers um, right now, but I will say uh, Memphis got a, um, a big commitment from an old Dominion running back. His name is escaping me right now, but he's very good. But at the same token, they're losing Cameron Jackson, a big defensive tackle in the middle uh, for them. Uh, and he's probably going to the SEC from what I hear. Uh, so those are just two recently that I saw. Uh, Tyler Grubbs, the linebacker transfer that SMU offered from Louisiana Tech, is going home to New Orleans to play for Tulane. Um, there are a few others out there, I would imagine. But um, those are the ones ju just off the top of my head um, that I uh, know We'll do a deeper dive kind of maybe going into uh, the spring as to where those stand and who got on campus this year for those schools. And then we can kind of once again reassess that uh, after the second window in May because it's not done yet. But uh, those are a few that off the top of my head really stood out. Um, but now we jump in uh, to the high school recruiting questions for 2024. Uh, there is a sense around the program that I think SMU will be a little bit more targeted in 2024. They have their quarterback commit in Tyler Aronson out of the, the Sunshine State. Um, he's been committed. He's been on campus for multiple game visits um, and is is you know helping recruit for this 2024 class. And the first question and, and really the main question for, for this whole segment is, you know, what players does SMU have legitimate shots or decent odds to land that are highly rated in 2024? Same question, uh, kind of about maybe an underrated or a sleeper prospect in that run. Uh, there are a bunch of prospects that were listed, um, and I'll just kind of list uh, the ones that stand out to me that I know visited um, or that SMU is really, really high on that they're going to go all out for, uh, and we'll kind of we'll kind of run down some of those. I don't want to give away um, too much because we are going to have a big piece on you know intel on the 2024 class and what to expect. Um, with SMU and, and kind of, you know, targets to watch. So I don't want to spoil all of that, but there are guys that have been very active in tweeting out that they've been to SMU. And, and so definitely worth mentioning. The first one I'll mention is Harry Stewart, the Frisco Centennial running back. Uh, he is a three-star prospect on the on three consensus, but he has some serious offers already to his name. Um, he's just on the cusp of being a four-star guy, has Baylor, has Cal, Texas A&M as well in there. Um, and he's been on campus multiple times with SMU and seems really high on the program. Uh, Johan uh, Cardenas, this is the four-star guy that if you're looking at the running back position, I feel like they probably have uh, as good of a shot to land as anyone. Um, he's out of the Houston area. He is a top 75 prospect overall, the number five prospect at the running back position in the country for us at on three. Um, he's... Uh, just unreal. He's really, really special. 
Uh, SMU leads the on three recruiting prediction machine for both of these players. Um, and he already has uh, Colorado, UTSA, and Texas Tech offers as well. Um, but we're expecting he's going to make a big jump this spring as he gets out to colleges and things like that. So SMU is is really high on his list early on, and, and SMU feels the same about both of those players. Then you get into the wide receiver room, and I would say um, this one is one that still maybe needs to be worked out a little bit more. Um, they have some offers out to some South Florida kids that I would kind of say uh, tough to see them landing. Uh, they're also very selective in terms of who they've offered. Uh, one that is worth noting, I would say, uh, is Parker Livingstone because he was teammates with Jackson Lavender at Lucas Lovejoy. Um, he's on the cusp of being a four-star, but he also has some big offers already to his name. So keep an eye on him at least. Um, Kennedy Brantley is, a number one, uh, is another one at Melissa, uh, who's kind of on that radar as well. The offensive line class out of you know interior and tackle, uh, they have 10 offers out across the board. They have some, some offers out um, kind of nationally here and there. Um, but I'll point to a couple on this one. Uh, Daniel Cruz is one. He's a three-star offensive lineman from uh, North Richland Hills where Rasheed Rice went. Um, he's a three-star prospect with some big offers as well. Um, Baylor, Texas, Texas A&M, Ohio State have all already offered, but I do think he's in the mix. Um, one name out of all of this, I think, that really stands out to me, though, um, or two, a lot, Ellis Davis out of Prosper, SMU just offered. Uh, he's a huge, huge tackle. Um, I think they have a chance with him to kind of build a relationship and get in there and, and have a shot. But the one that stands out to me so far is Gibson Pyle, uh, a three-star prospect for the on three consensus, but we have him in the on 300 for the class of 2024. Um, he's the top 20 interior offensive lineman. He's been to SMU for a visit. Uh, he's added Kansas state, North Carolina this fall, um, and Stanford as well. So a very high academic kind of kid. Uh, that is, you know, being recruited by, you know, Stanford. Um, and, and I think that resonates with him. He's been up to SMU a couple times. Uh, they have really turned up the heat on him since they were allowed to September 1st. Uh, and, I, and I think he really fits the kind of football player that, you know, will give SMU a serious look. So he's got some serious offers, not saying he's going to come, but definitely someone uh, that they feel uh will be in the mix. Another one uh, that is worth noting on the defensive side of the ball uh, for the Mustangs is um, Logan Thomas. He's teammate was teammates this past year with 2023 signee Alex Kilgore uh, at Katie Paytow. SMU's on him pretty hard early on, I would say. Uh, and he sits for on three inside the top 200 overall prospects in the country. Uh, he's got a great frame as an edge rusher. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how his, uh, recruitment goes and how he develops and all of those things. Um, Duncanville defensive uh, tackle, big, big, big uh, plug in the middle. Uh, Alex January was on campus for a game this year, at least one. Um, so he's one to watch. He's got some big offers. Um, Brandon Booker uh, out of DeSoto. Um, and this one kind of probably takes a hit a little bit after Jaden Milner Jones go, went elsewhere. Um, but I do feel like he liked what he saw from SMU when they had a bunch of those guys on campus. Uh, and he'll give them a look. I know he's got some uh, ties with Oklahoma State. Um, LSU's got an offer out to him already. So his his recruitment's going to get interesting. But, um, you know, Brandon Booker is a linebacker that is really, really productive. I loved him uh, this fall when I saw him a lot. So uh, those are probably the ones that I would uh, highlight out of the highly rated guys. Um Outside of uh, William Nettles is a is a 89 for us. So he's right on the cusp of being a, a four-star prospect for on three. He's very, very high on SMU. He's so high on SMU that I'm almost worried that something's going to happen and he's, he's not actually going to end up staying home and staying in Dallas. He goes to Dallas Christian. Uh, but he's been very active about SMU. He's been on campus a ton. Uh, so he's somebody to watch uh, without a doubt. And then they're kind of swinging for the fences with two – uh, safety prospects as well, I would say, um, and, and another um, kind of athlete um, in Xavier Phil Same. Uh, I think he's going to go bigger, though, just kind of the feel that I get from him. And then Kadavian Dotson Walker, the Duncanville safety. Again, I kind of think he's going to end up going bigger 
And then uh, Jamarie Cauley, uh, a Dallas South Oak Cliff guy, um, has been to SMU a ton. He's a four-star prospect on the on-three consensus, a top 150 overall prospect. Um, really, really highly thought of um, around the area just in terms of everything he can do. He does it all. Um, and so he's somebody to watch uh, without a doubt, at least to see uh, you know how many visits he takes and kind of where his recruitment goes because SMU could certainly – you know, maybe end up being a finalist for him. Um, now you get into, uh, you know, the sleeper guys. I think one player that I'll highlight that has an SMU offer that's a sleeper um, is is Ashton Williams um, and and Chris Wakoma. Uh, those are two safeties that SMU's on. Um, I think those guys are uh, underrated. I think they could play multiple positions. Um, it, well, especially Ashton Williams, I should say. I think he's got the chance to grow into a linebacker type, um, but. Look, I, I just think right now, I mean, both of, the, both of them are underrated. I mean, Wacoma's got some big offers. Um, Ashton Williams does as well. But, um, you know, Ashton Williams is a three-star and Chris Wacoma is unranked. So um, those are two guys that I, I think that really kind of stand out in terms of, you know, being under undervalued, um, especially around the area. So with that, we'll, we'll cover a lot more on, on 2024 and kind of what's next um, for SMU on that respect um, here soon. But I do want to get into the the meat of this podcast, which will be the team side of things. Um, and we're going to kind of go rapid fire on this one. Um, and look, you might listen to this podcast and say, hey, Billy, what about this guy or what about that? And I very, mel- very well um, might agree with you and, and say, you know what, you're right. I missed that. Um, but in terms of uh, breakout candidates for SMU in 2023, so how I view a breakout candidate in my mind would be somebody that comes in under the radar out of the transfer portal or high school ranks or somebody who didn't really do too much this past season um, and has the chance to really emerge as a key contributor uh, for SMU. So that's, that's kind of how I'm going to approach this. I don't, I don't think I'm going to have anyone that will be, uh, from the the portal or from the high school ranks, I don't think on this um, on this one. Um, I will say I think Alex Kilgore has a chance to play a ton as a linebacker, so I guess he could break out. Um, but in terms of breakout candidates, um, I think you got to look at Jake Bailey. Um, we know what he can do, but obviously he got hurt and his whole season was lost um, after that for the most part. So we saw flashes, but if I'm picking a breakout player for SMU fans to know – probably going to be Jake Bailey. So I'll pick Jake Bailey. Um, I think he's going to have a terrific year in the slot and I'll have a real opportunity to, um, you know, make a ton of plays. Um, the wide receiver room has plenty of opportunities for players to step up, uh, but that's the one that really stands out to me so far. Uh, and then I think Ahmad Moses is a no brainer breakout candidate. I mean, he's kind of, he kind of finished the way uh, Brian Massey kind of did just minus the return game stuff in um in the in the 2021 season kind of had that buzz around him going in the offseason i think ahmad moses is a slam dunk breakout candidate for smu probably probably somebody that starts at safety i just think he's so good um and has a really bright future high iq guy um really really um you know just I think he's going to be one of the better defensive backs to come through SMU in in recent memory. So I'm very high on um, what what Ahmad Moses brings to the table. Um, I think on the offensive line, Ben Sparks has a chance to be a breakout player. Um, You lose Jalen Thomas, who's versatile. Joe Bissinger's moving on. Um, They lost Owen Condon, who plays tackle. But I think Ben Sparks has a chance to break out. He's just kind of been stuck behind a Justin Osborne. Then they bring in Joe Bissinger to just give him just a little bit more time. And then Jalen Thomas was on the roster and Branson Hickman, you know, being, being the center kind of holds that down. And it's just been one of those things where he just hasn't been able to break out, but I say no more. Um, Ben Sparks, he redshirted in 2020. He played in six games in 2021. He saw plenty of action for, for SMU playing in all 12 games in 2022. Um, or maybe uh, I guess thir- thirteen games in twenty twenty two. So he's not he's not been somebody that's really been nicked up or anything like that. He's played, um, and I I feel like this is his this is his time. This is this is one of those guys that 
when you look at offensive line development, you liked what you saw coming out of high school. He was kind of, I think he was middle of the road uh, in terms of that overall class. Um, but I think he's the guy that can break out on the offensive line and take a starting job. Two bold predictions for 2023. We'll do this, guys. We'll do one on the defensive side of the ball, and we'll do one on the offensive side of the ball. Um, my bold prediction uh, for the 2023 season um, would have to be uh, that oh, Preston Stone is the second leading rusher on SMU's roster. That's pretty bold. And I think, in my opinion, you look at the the guys that they brought in, LJ Johnson, Jalen Knighton, you bring back Kamar Wheaton, you bring back Tyler Levine, that's four. That's a lot of mouths to feed right there. So think about the kind of carry dri- distribution that they could have. And I think with Preston Stone, his willingness to tuck in and run and how they could use him in the run game, I'm going to say he's the second leading rusher for SMU. That doesn't mean they're they're a bad running the football team. I just think when you have that many options, maybe it cuts into it. Maybe he is your second leading rusher. So that's a bold prediction on the offensive side of the ball. I'll go uh, with a, another bold prediction that SMU ranks in the top 40 of pass defense in the country. Um, to, to put that into perspective, um, I'm looking it up right now, but look, the run defense was horrific. And I probably could do the same bold prediction for um, uh, the run run game and kind of move them back a little bit and have them have a big turnaround. But honestly, you have, you have, um, uh, you know, Elijah Chapman coming back. You have Devere Levelson coming back. You have Stephon Wright if he's healthy. Um, you have some guys on the edge. Um, you have Jalen Samuels. But right now, you've only added Jordan Miller and Elijah Roberts to that group. Um, you added Kevin Allen out of the high school ranks. But you, you've you got to, I, I think, just add a, one more piece to really think that the run game, I, I think it's going to be improved. And the linebackers will play a big part of that. Um, they can't get much worse. But to be to take a big big step forward i just feel like they're missing a linebacker or they're missing a defensive lineman so um smu has the pass rushers they rank 74th in passing yards allowed per game this season which isn't bad i think they they could creep into the the top 40 maybe even top 30 i think the if you if charles woods pans out that's a lockdown corner then the other spot you've got all sorts of options you got cj sanders from fresno state um, you've got Jahari Rogers coming back. Um, Bryce McMorris comes back from his injury. Uh, I'm probably forgetting someone here. Uh, AJ Davis had a nice finish to his uh, freshman campaign. I, I think they've got the chance uh, with those pieces at corner. Then you add in Jonathan McGill. Um, you know they 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 have some other pieces at safety. Ahmad Moses we're high on. Brandon Crosley returns. Brian Massey returns. I think collectively it could be a pass defense that pops up into that top 40, top 35 overall um, groups in the country in terms of passing yards allowed per game. In terms of the actual O-line depth, this is another question. Um, Bissinger is gone. Condon is still gone. Um, What is the O-line depth and what do you think the two deep will be next year? I think you're going to see it go left to right here, the starting group. Marcus Bryant, um, Ben Sparks, uh, Branson Hickman, and Justin Osborne, and then Hyron White, the Missouri transfer. Then your left tackle. Um, this is where it gets a little interesting. Cam Irving was playing out there last year. Um, this this is a position um, that I feel like they could really address. Um, I, I feel like if they get P.J. Williams, I think he's your – your left tackle heir apparent to Marcus Bryant and could um, push uh, could really push Marcus Bryant potentially for that spot. Um, I feel like this is where it gets just a little dicey because if they add Drake Metcalf out of the transfer portal from Stanford, there's going to be more competition. Could he unseat Branson Hickman? Could he be the backup to Branson Hickman at center? Um, that that's probably your middle your your two centers right there. Um, then you have 
Um, Balen Robinson is a huge question mark with his health. Dalton Purdue, kind of the same thing. He could be your backup right tackle, uh, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and then you look for Jacob Waller, Rhett Larson, um, Reagan Gill, Alex Woods, any of those guys to kind of emerge um, in that too deep backup um, behind those guys. So uh, the, uh, the st starting five kind of looks pretty uh, solidified. They need to get PJ Williams. They need to get Drake Metcalf. They really need to kind of make that work. Um, I think this is going to be um, a really good group. And then it's term in terms of how many offensive linemen does Rhett Lashley want to carry, it's got to be around 15. Um, I think that's kind of the sweet, sp sweet spot, 15, 16 uh, offensive linemen. Um, and I think just kind of off the top of my head, that's probably right around with where they are, where they're at, especially after they add those high school um, players uh, into the fold as well. So um, next question, who gets the most carries at running back next year? I'm going to go with Jalen Knighton. Um, I just think he's brings a little bit more every down kind of um, playmaking ability. And he's the veteran of the group outside of Tyler Levine. Um, and, and Velton Gardner has to stay healthy. Who knows what Trey Siggers is going to do. Um, and then how do the current players feel about the new transfer portal additions? Uh, Elijah Chapman was thrilled. He was saying how it's great that they're, you know, addressing the roster. They're bringing in new players. So I, I think he's it, kind of speaking for a lot of the guys. I mean, it's competition. You don't like to see somebody brought in to take your spot. But at the same time, uh, you have, um, you know, a need for it. They weren't a good run defense this year. They weren't consistent enough um, in certain positions. And all over the defense, they need help. So um, I think most of the guys are pretty okay with it. We really haven't seen many enter the portal that were unexpected, um, in my mind, outside of Tanner Mordecai. So um, I, I think they're well-received. And they're guys that – and Scott Simons told me this uh, when we chatted. And by the way, we've put some of our interviews with uh, Scott Simons and Casey Woods up on the site. But he said – you really have to dive in to doing transfer portal evaluations. Uh, you can't just take a guy because they're a good player. They have to fit. They have to fit your culture and you have to do your research or else you're going to end up um, like, you know, some schools where it just doesn't pan out. You're going to end up like Houston potentially where it just seems like things are a, a mess down there. Um, in terms of players to take the biggest step forward next season, um, I think Devere Levelston kind of disappointed a little bit, but look, I mean, he had an awful, awful year losing his mom. I think he's going to be rejuvenated and kind of ready to go for next year. And, and really, um, he's not a breakout guy, but I think he can take a big step forward next season. And, and it's, I think it's his money year as well. So I look for him to take a huge step forward. Um, kind of, you know, Jake Bailey, Jordan Curley at wide receiver, Moochie Dixon, is another one. I think those three guys can take big, big steps forward. Um, you look at uh, um, somebody like Elijah Chapman, too, going back to the defensive line. Um, you know, um, I, I think um, uh, I, I think he's really been someone that, you know, is held down the middle, probably isn't big enough to, to play at that position. Um, and now with Jordan Miller kind of taking over the nose spot, uh, Elijah Chapman can maybe play a little bit elsewhere and play it out on the edge, not as a pass rusher, but kind of move into more of a three technique type of player. So I think Elijah Chapman is somebody uh, that could take a step forward with that change in the roster. Um, and then look, Brian Massey had a brutal season tackling. Um, he was still one of the top tacklers on the team statistically, but he has to get better. I think he can improve. He's got the athleticism to do, do it. Um, if he can improve his mindset, I think he can take a step forward. I'm still going to ride on that. I mean, I think he's just too athletically gifted not to have a chance to. Um, and then um, which group will take the biggest step forward and which take which group will take the biggest step back? Oh, this is a tough one. The biggest step forward, I would say, is is a secondary. I don't think there's any question about that. What they've added into the into the mix there so far has been really, really nice. Um, and they still have guys that are coming back: Kavars Hall, AJ Davis. Um, you know, they just have guys that are still coming up, um, and they've addressed that position really, really well. Uh, biggest step back, and I think people will freak out when they hear this, but 
I think the linebacker position was not as bad as people want to think it was. Take that with a grain of salt. It was a bad defense. But there were a lot of issues on the defense, and the talent level at linebacker was pretty good. Talent, pure talent. They did not have the season that I think they wanted to. Jimmy Phillips um, you know, had the best season. Shannon Reed was not that instant plug-and-play, maybe impact guy um, that maybe they thought he was going to be. Um, and then, you know, Isaac Slade Matatia was very inconsistent. That said, you have a mod walker who they love coming from Liberty. They still need to add another transfer linebacker in my mind. They've offered some, but then you're kind of relying on Cam Farrar to step up, Jaquandis Burns to step up, Alex Kilgore and Brandon Maizano out of the, the freshman class to step up. That's a lot of stepping up. Um, I think you know what you have with a mod walker with the staff's familiarity and kind of what he brings and how productive he's been. Uh, but there's a lot of question marks. So I think that's the position you got to look at it, look at as far as taking a step back. Also add that I think the tight end position could take a step forward. Um, if they can get a difference maker um, like Jake Roberts out of the transfer portal, they'll have a good shot to do that. Um, finally, win loss prediction for next season. I, I think, and look, I, ha I haven't dove into that much. So I, I would say, you have OU and TCU on the roster or on the on the schedule next season. And it's hard to sit here and say that SMU has the ability to to beat TCU with where TCU is at right now, right? But I think SMU played TCU the best, if not the best, um, out of pretty much everyone on their on their uh, schedule outside of Kansas State. So SMU will have a shot to beat TCU. Oklahoma has a lot of issues too, but there is depth that's different in my mind with Oklahoma as bad as badly coached as they were this year, I felt like. And some of the things that they needed to happen did not go their way at all. Um, this this is a, a team that should be able to get to the conference championship game. So whatever that looks like, that's what the goal is. And that's what my expectation is. If they get PJ Williams, if they get Drake Metcalf, if they get a transfer tight end, and if they can find another solid piece at linebacker and a solid piece in the secondary, this team has zero excuse. I mean, in my mind, there are things that happen. Preston Stone has to develop and, and be the guy. And you need a quarterback to go win you a, a conference championship. But the, the, the team as a whole, they've got the pieces. And they've got the pieces to win every game. They do. We saw that this year. But in terms of a prediction, I would, I would probably say 9-3. and three. It'd be a one-loss conference, um, one, one um, conference season and then two losses to Oklahoma, TCU. I, I think they could beat OU. I just don't – I just don't – want to predict that right now as we sit here on December 30th um, doing a mailbag podcast. I want to dive in more. I want to see how they uh, get better in the offseason and what their changes look like because they'll have those as well. Um, finally, we'll talk about the draft. Where do I think Rasheed Rice goes? I think he goes in the second round. I think him playing through that broken toe says a lot. He was dominant. People want to dog him here and there for the drops, but the dude was being targeted all year long. He's a very, very good draft prospect. He's exactly what NFL teams want from a personality perspective. Um, just a good dude. I think he'll, uh, if he gets back and bounces back from the toe injury really well, he'll run well uh, in the combine, probably be a four or five guy. Um, and I think he'll be in the second round. Uh, any other SMU guys I think will get drafted? I don't think so. Maybe Jalen Thomas. I think that the, the multi-sport aspect coming out of high school, play basketball, multi-year starter, um, just hadn't ever really found a home uh, on the SME offensive line, but played some of his best football this year. So that's a good good sign for him. Finally, uh, what's my view on the December calendar? Do we need to get rid of early signing day? Move it to the before the senior season. Uh, just let kids enroll early if they want to. So we no longer need it, question mark. Seems like too much in December has crept into the season with coaching, firings, and the like. I could not agree more um i'm just gonna answer it like this 
I think the signing period for football should be the same early signing period that basketball has. That makes it before the playoffs start for football teams. And then you can have guys who are unsigned, still visit your campus for games. You can official them for games if you want. And then for high school recruiting, it should be dead for December. That's the middle of the playoffs. It should be dead. I don't care. Dead, dead, dead. Okay. Then you get into the spring and they can keep the February signing period and it can be a race for a few weeks to host kids for official visits leading up to National Sign Day. Maybe you scoot National Sign Day back a little bit into like mid to late February. Um, but basketball has April, um, like, like, you know, regular college kind of admissions process processes go. Um, and the other sports do as well. That way these coaches can focus on the transfer roster retention, um, bowl games, all those things. They, there should be kids on campus in December when their teams are in playoffs. If they, um, you know, advance that far while they're, they're going through, bowl prep, while they're this, while they're that. It's just insane. These guys don't get any rest. College football is going to lose a ton of good coaches because of it. Um, so move it to the middle of the season, right before the high school playoffs start. Unsigned guys can take it to the spring. You can't take any visits in December. Sorry, it's for transfer guys only. Um, it should be completely dead, like before Christmas, obviously, uh, and then through the new year. Uh, and then that's kind of how it goes. So, um, you know, I, I just I think there has to be some there has to be more dead periods. It's just unbelievable how many visits these kids end up taking and how many photo shoots they do. One rule I'd love to see is if you're a sophomore, you can't take a tour. You can't take a tour. It's like baseball. I think baseball has this rule. If you go camp somewhere for baseball, you get out of the car, you go camp, you get back in the car and you leave. You can't even talk to the coaches. I don't I think this is the exact rule can't talk to the coaches unless they're coaching you. You can't say, oh, uh, what do you think about the depth chart? Nope. They have to be given coaching. I, I'm sick of the photo shoots. Call me an old man, whatever. I think photo shoots are awesome for official visits. I think they're great. You have them in their, your top schools. You're getting that close. Put the jersey on. Let them see, let them see how it looks. Honestly, um, I think that's the move. I have a bunch of thoughts on the, the calendar in general, um, but those are kind of the big ones. I think all of July should be dead, um, you know, and just have a run of, of summer uh, from, you know, the, the camp season in June. Uh, I think that's the easiest way to do it. So with that, guys, our last question, with it being New Year's Eve, you might be doing uh, a keg at a party. You might have, you know, some people doing keg stands. So out of the last three SMU coaches, Rhett Lashley, Chad Morris, and Sonny Dykes, if they took a keg stand contest, who would win? Well, I, I think Chad would lose. I'm sorry. A lot of people have, would back me up on that one. Rhett Lashley, Sonny Dykes, who would win? And this has nothing to do with anything other than, like, I mean, Sonny, Sonny's a big dude. I think he could take down a keg. Um, I, I think if it was a beer chugging contest, I'd probably go with Sonny. Um, Rhett Lashley, you know, in terms of the true keg stand, like, and this isn't a shot sunny or anything like that, but like just like you know, being on the keg and, and doing the keg stand and all of that and kind of balancing that, maybe, maybe he takes it. Uh, but in terms of beer chugging, I think Sonny, Sonny might might be able to do that um just a little bit more. So that maybe just kind of one A, one B, you know, Sonny could gar gargoyle it. And um, you know, if you've ever done that on the keg stand gargoyling, but um, we've gone off the rails on the podcast now. Uh, but I, I think, look, the last two SMU coaches, both are great recruiters. And I think some of the best recruiters can, can have, you know, a few beers and do it in just about any setting, uh, quite honestly. So, um, that's my take on it. Um, I'll, maybe I'll ask Rhett next time I see him, Hey, have you had some experience in that regard? And, and what, what do you think? But I think Sonny, um, has, uh, for sure, uh, back in his day, I would say so. Um, that's my power rankings on uh, former SMU coaches keg stance. So uh, next time we'll, we'll do who could, um, you know, kick back the most wine, I guess. But with that, guys, um, it's time for the New Year uh, celebration to begin. We'll be watching football all day tomorrow. I can't wait um, to just be chilling and enjoying all that. 
a lot of NFL games on as well. Fantasy football championships, of course. Um, so hope you guys have a great new year with your family. Thanks for listening to this edition of the podcast. Hope it gets you through your your holiday errands and your and your New Year's Eve prep. Uh, thanks for subscribing to OnThePonyExpress.com. We're we're coming up on our one year anniversary. It's crazy. Time has flown by so fast. Um, but thank you guys uh, for making this new or for making 2022 the best year yet for me. Um, lots of things went into that. My wife as well, and getting married to her, family, friends. Um, so very, very thankful entering 2023 and uh, can't wait uh, for what's next. So hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Hit the subscribe button to OnThePonyExpress.com as well as our YouTube channel. Thank you guys for listening and I'll catch you next time. Happy New Year.